Good morning and welcome back to the Broadcast Retirement Network's BRN Sunday Podcast. I'm Jeff Snyder, your host. I'm going to be joined by members of the media, academia, and financial services as we go around the globe to discuss all the issues related to retirement markets, technology, personal finance, and so much more. We've got a great show for you today. Hope you enjoyed your Independence Day holiday. Sit back and relax and enjoy this episode of the BRN Sunday Podcast. We're going to kick things off with a look at technology. Joining me online, Senior Technology and Consumer Products Reporter with The Motley Fool, Mr. Daniel Klein. Hey, Dan, how are you? I'm good. How are you? Doing well. A short week this week. Um, yeah, well, at least in terms of markets. Uh, <laughs> looking forward to the Independence Day holiday, but obviously a lot of news going on. And I know uh, you know a lot of things going on in tech, a lot of things going on in markets, just a lot of things going on. Um, I know you wanted to talk about data caps. Uh, This seems to be back in the news. What can you tell us? Yeah. So this is one of those scenarios where something that was gone has started to creep back. There There was legislation in place Uh, stopping data caps. And that has sunsetted and gone away. And your cable company, your ISP, not everyone is doing it, but many of them have decided, you know what, Uh, you're all stuck at home. Uh, You're watching too much Netflix. If you go over 100 megabytes of data, we're going to charge you more. And in my opinion, I, I understand why you would do this if in general, during normal period, you were going after peak users who are out of whack with everyone else. But right now, we're all working at home. We're all consuming more data. This is just a bad look. Yeah, well, I think I think from a public relations perspective, and I'm really surprised by this, by the way, that, you know, why would you want to look bad? I mean, that, that shouldn't, how you look shouldn't necessarily always drive your decision. But I think you're absolutely right that Everyone's working from home. We have all these people that are unemployed. The one refuge that they may have is watching a Netflix or a Hulu or Amazon Prime or whomever, right? And that's a way to kind of disconnect a little bit. Um, I I can tell you that Verizon, who is my carrier for my phone, or mine and my wife's, they actually gave us 15 gigabytes for free over the last three months. So that was – that's complete opposite of what what, what you just mentioned. Yeah. I mean, look. Most carriers offer unlimited data when you're talking about phones, um, but unlimited tends to not mean unlimited. Usually what happens is if you are way out of whack, they compared to other customers, they have the right to say, okay, you still have unlimited data, but we're going to slow you down to 2G. In my opinion, you know, if I go to an all-you-can-eat buffet, I should be able to have all I can eat. Uh, So if you sell me unlimited data – it should be unlimited. That's and true. when I buy an internet connection at home, there is the assumption that it's unlimited. And when it's not, they're not exactly coming up front and saying, uh, hey, Jeff, uh, you actually only get 100 megabytes. And 100 megabytes is roughly uh, 30 Netflix movies, uh, 17 hours of work, or however it breaks down. Mm-hmm. There needs to be more transparency here. I have no issue with companies charging you as you go uh, if that's how I choose to pay. But they need to tell you about it. This needs to not be a gotcha, not be a surprise, especially during a global pandemic. Yeah. I, I mean, I think it's certainly something that uh, you should know what you're buying, right? I think you have to be able to to know what you're buying, what the – now, we didn't see the pandemic coming. but And I have to think usage is up significantly, as you outlined at the beginning of the segment. Uh, but you've got to understand what you're buying as a consumer, and you have to have that information in front of you and be able to c- – be able to comprehend what it all means. And if you're not being forthright or not being upfront, or you're putting in a very, you know, six point font, right. Which is, I can't read that without my glasses on that, that makes it really hard to comprehend. And then you're shocked, surprised, saddened when you get a bill for X number of dollars in addition to what you're paying and you're out of work. I mean, it's just not good. I wouldn't be angry if providers, whether it be wireless carriers or internet companies, came out and said, due to the pandemic and incredible increased use, harder operating conditions for us, we are charging you a two ninety nine per month COVID-19 surcharge. I'd be totally fine with that. It's the using a pandemic as a way to get what's really an outdated practice reinstalled. Look, many of the high impact apps have taken steps. Netflix is streaming in some markets at a lower quality because yeah. they understand that you know what they're doing to the system. I'm fine with everyone mutually working together and saying, "Hey, 
I know this isn't going to be great, but uh, you know your uh, your video subscription is not going to be the quality you're used to. There might be a little bit more buffering. I think we're all willing to cut each other some slack, but the last thing you should be doing is using a pandemic as a way to put in sort of what were one-time sleazy practices and bring them back. Yeah, uh, it's certainly not a good look. You know, but Dan, you know what I found the other day? I found a book, and I started a reading a book. Have you heard of these <laughs> things? Books. Do you remember books? I, so I. I haven't read a physical book in four years uh, because when we decided to move to Florida, I gave away somewhere between 11 and 13,000 books that were in my library because I, I, I had kept a library my entire life thinking someday my child will read all these books. Well, I have a 16-year-old and he's read a sum total of no books, so I, I had to give up that idea. Yeah, well, I found books, reading a lot of books, that seems to, you know, we don't, I don't have Netflix, so we don't do that. But uh, yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot in here, uh, I think it, a lot of it talks about, I mean, to me, our usage of data, our uses of devices, is that always the best use of our time? Um, and then, as you mentioned, certainly business practices at the height of a pandemic, and it looks like this thing is going to subsist for a period of time. Dan, I want to switch gears. I know you also wanted to talk about Lululemon, which is a very, uh, for those that don't know, Lululemon is an outfitter. Uh, like an aerobic uh, athletic outfitter mainly for women, but I but also men use their uh, apparel as well. They do. They're, it's a athletic leisure or athlete athleisure as oh, it's known. Okay. And they're a very high end brand. They are famous for selling really expensive but also very high quality yoga pants. And Lululemon, which is a brand its customers identify with, think uh, Under Armour. Back in the day, before it became a sort of diluted brand that's heavily discounted, people pay full price for Lululemon. There is a little bit of status with wearing it, uh, and it's also a high-performance yoga pants. And Jeff, I don't know if you've done any yoga, but I have done a lot of yoga. Back when I lived in Connecticut, I, I did a few hundred classes in the last year I lived there. Wow. And there's a lot of reasons, if you're a woman, to wear high-quality yoga pants. They don't get pilly. They don't become see-through. They, uh, they, they don't embarrass you uh, in, in the many ways that cheap yoga pants could. I will point out that you can buy high-quality yoga pants for less, uh, maybe even at a Target, but those yoga pants don't have the logo, and that's really important. Lululemon just bought Mirror. What is Mirror? Mirror is sort of like Peloton, except instead of an exercise bike, they're selling you a six-foot screen. When it's turned off, it is actually a mirror. It is a six-foot screen that they do exercise classes on. Hmm. So if you want to do a yoga class, if you want to do personal training, hit classes, all sorts of, uh, in theory, meditation, eventually there might be counseling. There's all sorts of uses for it. It's an exercise machine that's not an exercise machine, and it's $1,500. It's been a pretty successful company so far, but it's private, so we know they've had about $45 million in sales. They were purchased for $500 million. Uh, that's a pretty good multiple. Lululemon was an early investor, so they know this company inside and out. But now they have this product that is a lifestyle product that doesn't take up nearly as much space as an exercise bike, and it's an elegant device. So if this is in your bedroom or your living room when you're not exercising, it's not like having a treadmill or an exercise bike sitting there. It's a pretty device. And this can now be sold to Lululemon devotees in Lululemon stores. So this gives them a massive marketing advantage and I think this deal is a home run. I'm not a huge fan of the mirror. There's nothing you can do on the mirror that you couldn't do on your phone or stream to your television. Uh, but that said, the audience for this isn't going to think that way. This is a really big, pretty iPad as, as far as I'm concerned. But that's not how the audience is going to take it. So I think these are going to fly off the shelves as, as soon as they're available in Lululemon stores. You know, it's interesting, Dan, because I see limitations with like Peloton – bikes or even using your you mentioned the phone i mean i can't even see the phone screen if i'm if i'm doing like trying to follow along with the fitness routine and many people are right now right they're trying to do at home workouts it's really hard to see so maybe this is and i always th think that look you know biking is great but you should you should be having a more rounded rounded workout right maybe get a little air boxing in or maybe do some jumping jacks or yoga or something and and maybe this is the way to do that, although I guess you could also use your television too, couldn't you? Yeah, so Jeff, I love the concept of this. I just don't think for $1,500 no, it's it a lot does of money. 
That's a lot it, of money. Yeah, I don't think it does enough. It's it's not an exercise bike is an exercise bike. Even if you're not connected, you can still ride it as an exercise bike. This is a I keep calling it a giant iPad because that's what it is. It's a screen. It does a little bit of health monitoring, but so does my my seventy dollar Fitbit. I'm actually wearing a hundred and fifty dollar Fitbit at the moment uh, that tracks my heart rate and my my steps and all the other things that I do. I have a $50 TiVo device that has Google Chromecast built into it. And if I'm watching an exercise video, I could uh, cast that right to my television. And it's a 60-inch television. So I can exercise right along. This solves a problem that wasn't a problem, but it does it in such an elegant way. I picture a lot of families that debated getting a Peloton but said, you know what? I have no place to put a Peloton. I don't want an exercise bike in my bedroom, in my living room, in my office, wherever it is, saying, you know what? I have a floor-to-ceiling mirror. I already have a six-foot mirror. I can get rid of that mirror, put this in, in that same place. It still functions as a mirror, and it's an exercise device. It's also a monthly subscription fee. So this is $39 a month, and I I think it's going to be tens of millions of people. And I'm not saying it has no value. Uh, It is absolutely a good way to follow on an exercise class to get – uh, you know, sort of that one-on-one experience, uh, even if it's not literally one-on-one, it's AI driven. Uh, I don't love the device personally, but I think a lot of Lululemon fans are going to buy it. Yeah. Well, if you're used to paying, you know, if you like these types of products and I don't know, it's kind of like, to me, kind of a trendy, I, it sounds very trendy. I mean, you can still work out with your iPad. You can work out, like you said, stream to your, to your uh, uh, television or to other screen, right? Um, But if you want something that's, you know, I think it kind of puts you, you know, people always want something that kind of sets them apart and say, oh, I got the latest this and that. I think it it probably does that. And I think you're right. It is going to sell. I think there's a certain market for it. I don't think that, you know, I think you're going to have to have buku bucks, obviously, to buy it. And then this is to do, you know, $40 a month. That just seems, that's $500 a year, Dan. I mean, that's a lot of money. Think of it this way. Think of it this way, Jeff. What do you pay to join a, a mid-level gym? I don't know. I don't belong to one. So a mid-level gym is roughly $40 a month. A high-end gym can be anywhere from like 80 to 120 right. A low-level gym might be 20 Right now, not a lot of people want to go to the gym. There is a lot of justification of – buying this device, financing it, and saying, okay, I'm spending $80, $90 a month, maybe a little more than I was spending at my gym, but I'm going to use it more often because it's right in my living room. I think that's the justification. Look, I'm, I spend in a regular week $180. I see my personal trainer three times a week. Um, that is, to me, about accountability. I am not going to make myself go to the gym if I don't have that appointment. So for me, investing that money is absolutely worth it. I consider that an investment in my health. I think a lot of people will see it that way. The difference is if I don't show up for my personal trainer, my personal trainer is angry. He's a person. He doesn't care that he got paid. He Part of his goal is to get me – I guess he's happy to be paid. I'm sure but he's happy he, to be paid. Yeah, but he wants me to get in shape. He wants me to stick to my convictions. That's what his job is. If I buy a Peloton or a mirror or a rowing machine or whatever it is, that device doesn't care. The Peloton does not, you know, they might automate a text, hey, haven't seen you in a while, but there is no shame. There is no guilt. If I bag on my trainer and say, hey, uh, I can't work out today. I'm I'm going to the all-you-can-eat buffet. He's going to scold me in a polite way and say, hey, well, what about tomorrow? Let's get back on track. Let's do what you have to do. I think these devices for some people are motivation. Mm. I know I have a colleague that him and his wife bought a Peloton at the beginning of all this, and they are devoted, and they use it, and they track progress. I'm guessing there's a lot of people like like my parents over the years who have a Peloton that's now a clothes rack. Uh, yeah. And I think the mirror for some people might end up just being a mirror. Yeah. I like the optionality of it that eventually maybe you use your mirror to do – uh, counseling sessions to do conference calls to do you know maybe uh, virtually try on clothes who knows what uh, so I do think there's some potential for this device mm-hmm. but right now it is just a big screen well I guess we're going to see how this all plays out Dan Dan always a pleasure chatting with you look forward to having you back on the network this week we'll talk to you very soon see you in a little while Bye. Well, let's check in on the latest social media trends it's been an up and down week in the markets but so much going on and joining me on the line, he's a senior financial services editor for LinkedIn, and he's also the editor of the This Week in Finance newsletter, which you can find, of course, on the LinkedIn platform, Devin Banerjee. Devin, welcome back to the program. 
Thanks, Jeff. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Doing. It's been an interesting week, to say the least. Market's been up and down, but good jobs numbers. I think good manufacturing data numbers. Yeah. It just boggles the mind, and I'm sh- sure that you have no shortage of great content on the site this week or the platform this week. Excuse me. Yeah, no, absolutely. We have seen just a flood of really interesting uh, content, both coming from leaders in financial services themselves, as well as other publishers on LinkedIn, around the news. Um, And, you know, today we're recording this on Thursday this week. It's actually an early jobs day this month, as you as you alluded to. Um, And, yeah, some good news out that people are talking about on the platform today. The unemployment rate has fallen uh, still on an absolute level quite high. It came in at 11 0.1% 0.1% uh, for the month of June. That's down from 13.3% in May. Hmm. You know, I should say there's been this uh, misclassification error that the BLS has been has been highlighted, and they say, uh, you know, without that error, the rate would be at 12.3% in June. So it's still coming down uh, on, on, on the downward trajectory. Um, and I should also say, you know, this, the data collection for this for this most recent month's report. Uh, was completed before the halting or reversing of some states' reopening plans uh, in the past week or so, which uh, you and I have discussed. So um, some good news, but some uh, conditions on that good news. And uh, actually, one of those conditions, which is another item we featured this week that was quite popular, which which is about, you know, this um, idea of pay cuts becoming Mm -hmm. quite rampant during this uh, you know this downturn so this was an analysis by uh the, the washington post with some economists at the university of chicago they found at least four million private sector workers have had their pay cut during this pandemic uh primarily white collar workers hmm. uh actually and they found that workers are about twice as likely during this downturn than the past great recession to get a pay cut um, that's according to their research using uh, data from ADP, the uh, processor of payrolls. Um, as I said, salary cuts are spreading most rapidly in white collar industries, which is actually typically a hallmark of a deeper recession mm-hmm. and a slower recovery uh, due to that real blow in, in consumer spending that comes as a result of that. So, yes, going back to the jobless numbers, you know, trending in the right direction, but while some people may be, well, many people are retaining their jobs at the same time, uh, this issue of pay cuts is really coming onto the radar. Well, I mean, it, I guess it makes sense logically. Um, if your revenues are there, how can you pay the same sal- pay the same salaries? Uh, that being said, I did see an ad, an, ad, an article that Aon, uh, which is a big consulting firm, uh, and, and I'm just putting this out as an example where they brought. They, I guess they had to cut some people's salaries, people with their employees' salaries. They're bringing them back on and now paying them what they would have made during that period of time and giving them a bonus. So I, I guess it just shows that some employers can reward those who stuck with them through thick and thin. And I guess more remains as to whether or not people will get back to full capacity in terms of their right. salaries, right? And then the other thing I'm thinking about, of course, with my retirement brain is – how are people going to save if they're not making as much money, but their costs remain yeah. the same? Yeah, absolutely. And in that Aon example, you know, that was a, a temporary dip for uh, workers and their households. And so, yeah. you know, the whole question is how temporary is this? And again, that it all comes back to how quickly, uh, you, you know, the economy and businesses, which make up the economy, can can recover. So hopefully it's temporary. But that is something that economists are starting to watch a bit more closely is uh, how temporary or how permanent these pay cuts are. Yeah. Um, okay. And and sticking with kind of the, the, the labor market, you know, another very popular item uh, this week for conversation on the platform was around reskilling and online training, um, something that you and I have talked about in the past. And the context here is that, you know, during the 2008 recession, um, and the recovery coming out of that long-term unemployment, which is defined as about 26 weeks or more, half of the year, 
you know, that remained high for years and that really scarred, uh, you know, worker psychology and of course, household finances. But this time around, there's all this new technology um, that's allowing workers to kind of prevent that fate by preparing for, for, for what comes next. So um, this was an article in the Wall Street Journal and LinkedIn actually uh, made some of our data public around LinkedIn learning, um, which is that downloads of certificate eligible classes in professions like accounting, project management, uh, IT have increased by more than 600% just since February. So more than a seven fold uh, increase in those uh, downloads of classes. Uh, edX, which is another online uh, education uh, company, which offers courses from universities like Harvard and Stanford, um, they've said that their enrollment in micro degrees and professional certificates have increased six to 15 times, depending on the course, um, during this crisis. And, uh, and, and I, I think this is a hopeful sign. You know, I think workers, uh, whether they're going through uh, layoff or furlough or pay cuts, as we just talked about, or, 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 or even if they've retained their job, that they're looking to pivot and strategically, you know, take quote unquote advantage of this period, um, you know, they're, they're, they're really putting in the work and these online platforms and these technologies are really allowing them to do that. Uh, the journal did some research and found, you know, there's some select jobs where the average salary can jump by 5%, 12%, 20%, just by adding a couple skills to those core, uh, the, the, those core skills. So industrial engineers, for example, uh, on average, if they add Python as a scale, they could see a 20% salary increase. Um, computer support specialists, if they add you know, project management skills, they could see a 21% increase in pay. So just this awareness around, um, you know, uh, whether it's reskilling or additional skilling during this downturn, I think will become a real hallmark of this period. Yeah, really interesting. And I, I credit to people who are kind of reskilling themselves and trying to continue to evolve. Uh, you know, we all go through different evolutions, it's important to pick up different skills along the way. And I think this is borne out in not only the data you're, that you're reporting on, Devin, but also every day with these uh, jobs. And we're always have, we're having to adapt to an ever-changing society, ever-changing uh, work environment. And that just necessitates adaptation. Absolutely. And it's, it, it's ever-changing. And I think another one of the hallmarks um, of the conversation mm -hmm. we're seeing in recent weeks is just preparing for the long term throughout all of this and even preparing for this period of, uh, of an economic contraction to last for a bit longer than we thought just a couple of weeks or months ago. You know, on the network this week, you and I talked about the, uh, the latest business uh, roundtable survey. Mm -hmm. That's its uh, second quarter CEO economic outlook survey. You know, even though that that composite index saw a huge drop, um, one of the main takeaways there was just how long the CEOs expect uh, this contraction to last. And these are the CEOs of America's biggest companies. You know, most of them um, expect these conditions uh, not to re expect business conditions not to recover by the end of 2021. And unfortunately, 27 percent of them, more than a quarter, don't expect uh, business conditions to recover to pre pandemic levels until after 2021. So, you know, I think people are, you know, unfortunately almost settling in to this idea that this will last a long time, but fortunately are taking some of those steps like we just talked about in terms of reskilling and online education and just trying to make the best of this, uh, of this crisis. Well, yeah, certainly. Well, Devin, always a pleasure chatting with you. Really interesting conversations. Enjoy uh, your weekend and enjoy the week off because I know you're taking off next week or part of a, uh, I think it's part of the LinkedIn curriculum right i mean you're doing something it's like working off campus right or something like that I, I uh, and that's right actually every year linkedin in the u.s uh, gives all of its employees the week of or, or the week around fourth of july off so very grateful to them for that i think uh everyone not just us but uh, everyone viewers and listeners you know if you're fortunate to, to to be working and 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 be and enjoy your work um i think uh, everyone deserves some time off because it has been just such a hectic a couple of months and um we're all trying to adapt every day to this yeah i wonder what the cortisol levels are around the world 
you know, the, the measure of stress. So, Devin, take care. Enjoy your week off, and we'll talk to you when you get back. All right, Jeff. Take care. Okay. Bye. Bye. Welcome back. Now we're going to talk markets. Joining me on the line, Oliver Rennick is the lead anchor for the TD Ameritrade Network. Oliver, great to have you on the program today. Thank you, Jeff. Appreciate it. Yeah, happy Independence Day to you. Hope you have a great long weekend. I want to check in because even though we've got a short week, markets are closed Friday, lots still happening, and wondering if you wouldn't mind kind of taking us through what you've seen this week. Well, once again, we have found that it's just really hard to break the uh, bull market that has formed since March. Um, We see that the last month has been a little bit choppier since this uh, extension of the COVID cases really started ramping up. Um, That has been this kind of albatross hanging over the market. But right now it's apparently a weight that uh, bulls can bear because there is just a consistent buyer or buyers bounce, you know, whatever you want to call it, buy the dip has really been the simplest way to describe what's happening um, over the last, essentially the month of June. Um, It started off a little bit rocky and then really this past week just continued to show strength where very few people I think have really expected it to be. Um, So with that, the question is, well, one, why, if, why is the market seemingly okay with the latest string of coronavirus flare-ups. And mm-hmm. there's a lot of different, you know, theses for that. Um, uh, you know, one is just simply that, well, if it doesn't derail the consumer rebound or if it doesn't lead to another quarantine, then uh, it's bearable. Um, the other explanation is that, um, um, well, maybe – market is fine uh, with uh, quarantine if it means we're going to get printed more checks and people can yeah. just go back inside. And we've already done this and we know how it works. So the caveat to that one is, okay, well, let's make sure we're actually going to get those checks. And right now it's not very clear. And it's almost like the higher the market runs and the more the data beats, the less likely Washington is to want to jump to a support, another you know support measure so there's that complication that is really kind of the core biggest complication, which is do we have enough com- – do we have a big enough combination of natural economic growth and official support from the government to justify stocks where they are? Um, right now, it just uh, – you know, apparently there's enough people to believe we do. <laughs> so there could be a lot priced into the market. Um, maybe there's not. Maybe there is just too much – um, sort of despondency in March and fear about the future that there is just still bearish positioning getting wiped out and forced to chase the market. That's kind of the simplest explanation that I have, um, and I think it's probably still the best one. There were a lot of measures of investor positioning and sentiment that just were really, really depressed in the uh, at the end of the first quarter. Um, and a lot of money to be put to work. And right now, with the Treasury market not really going anywhere, that trade is kind of faded. So people just continue to look for places to, to get a return, and they find themselves in the U.S. stock market. So, um, and then, of course, the backdrop is tech companies are just absolutely crushing it, hmm. surviving, maybe even thriving in this environment, and those are the most important. So um, equities right now, unless there's a very clear sign that somewhere in the near future – we're not going to have enough support to get us through quarantine or or that the economy is just really slowing down, then it doesn't seem like there's really any stopping the train right now. Yeah, it's really interesting. I mean, we had a, and, and we had a strong June jobs report um, come out, right? And yep. uh, I think stronger manufacturing data and really interesting, I guess, thesis. I mean, we're down this road of government intervention, whether we agree or disagree, it is the road we're down. And it seems like people are talking. So uh, it's almost like a chicken in the egg where the market seems to be reacting to that positively. But also, you know, if you're a, a, a you know, Jay Powell, or as an example, or someone uh, in the in the in the White House thinking about do we need, or, you know, Treasury Secretary, do we need more stimulus? You're like, 
well, do we, you know, do we really need to do this? If we're, if we're... so, I mean, I, I, I get your point. I yeah. mean, it's, it's really kind of hard to, to flesh that out. Um, you know, what, you know, next week we come back off the July 4th holiday, as I mentioned, markets are closed on the third. What typically, if we were in a normal period, what typically tends to happen after a long holiday like July 4th? Well, it kind of depends on what the state of the market is going into it. Um, I don't really know. I'm sure there's probably a stat you could dig up. I don't. I don't know what that stat is. If there's a direct, uh, you know, result of you know long holiday, et cetera. But what we do know is that when there is a lingering uncertainty about the economy and consumer behavior, which we very much have in the um, coronavirus, well, we saw earlier in the year that that is able to really uh, spook markets into a weekend because it's just another day of uncertainty. A long weekend is uncertainty. And we would sell off into those weekends during February, March, and um, and April to some extent, mostly March. But we're just not doing that right now. So again, it's just kind of the sign that investors are pretty comfortable with um, with everything. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's just part of it is kind of amazing. And, it, you know, it, um, it seems like it's a big disconnect, but the other part of it is just its really not. A lot of it just kind of fits up together. We had the fastest bear market in history, a huge amount of bearish positioning that then was unwound. One of the fastest rebounds um, by a lot of metrics uh, in the economic data and the market, and here we are. So, um, you know, it's easy to kind of attach this um, kind of overall lingering fear and a rightful, probably correct trepidation people have about the world right now. But just, you know, applying that too much to the market is a little bit of a, um, is not exactly the right logic um, because what we've just seen is that there's quite a bit of functionality, even in the wake of, in the wake of this crisis and during the crisis too. FedEx this week told us that they had like a second Christmas of demand. So clearly Americans are ready to spend uh, whether they're inside or out. Yeah, I wonder if it's people are just fed up. I mean, I wonder if that's it. Well, I guess, Oliver, um, I'm glad we have you yeah. to kind of break things down for Anxiety us. Anxiety shopping. We're, yeah, I mean, it's just like, yeah, what, what are we going to do, right? I mean, you know, we're going to be wearing masks for the foreseeable future. We're going to be staying six feet away. We're going to be in like a – if you ever play NHL hockey from the old Madden days, you know, or not Madden, but like – Yeah, the, right. You know, you said the circle, <laughs> the circle around the, the figure that you were using, and I'm talking – dating myself with the Sega Genesis, right, or the – uh, Nintendo, um, you know, it, it's kind of like that. We're all like in these little mini bubbles, and I think people are just like right. fed up. So, Oliver, always a pleasure chatting with you. Have a great Thanks, long Jeff. weekend. Always appreciate your insight. Very, very fun to to engage with you. Have a great weekend. We'll talk to you soon. You got it. Thanks, bud. Bye. And welcome back, and we're going to uh, now shift gears, talk retirement, and who better to do that but Alessandra Melito? She is the retirement reporter for Dow Jones Market Watch. Allie, how are you doing? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing well. Looking forward to the holiday. I uh, hope we get some good weather. Uh, we were just chatting offline about how there's a lot of fireworks that we're hearing at night. So I guess uh, people are really excited. Fourth of July brings out all sorts of uh, folks. So very, very cool. Yes. For so, sure. They've yes. been celebrating all month. <laughs> they have been. They have been. Um, so I guess this will continue for Fourth of July as well. Uh, okay, so let's let's jump in. What's um, top of mind for you? And I know I think you just started a brand new column. So really interested to hear about that. Yeah. So um, Martha Watch has started a new column that I write. It's called Help Me Retire, and we take reader questions about their personal financial situations. And uh, we answer them as best as we can. Obviously, I uh, reach out to financial advisors. I don't do this alone. And uh, it's been really interesting to see just, like, all of the different questions people have. I, of course, you know, it focuses on the retirement aspect, not just, like, any random uh, personal finance questions. But they've been from, like, all, you know, all across the board. So Mm -hmm. in one article, uh, in one question, a woman, she was um, she's a 32-year-old stay-at-home mom. And uh, she was wondering if she would ever be able to enjoy retirement because, you know, right now they rely on their on her husband's earnings to mm-hmm. you know pay all the bills. Um, and another scenario, it was someone who, um, you know, he and his wife are doing just fine. But now with um, the CARES Act, they could take money out of 
uh, their retirement accounts because of the COVID-related distribution rules that, you know, expanded eligibility, um, you know, rules for withdrawals and loans from your retirement accounts. And they're like, well, you know, her hours were cut a little bit. Should I, um, should I take advantage of the CARES Act and, you know, take money out of my retirement account in order to pay off some debt that we have? Um, and another one, this guy saved uh, seven figures for his retirement, he and his wife, uh, because they've always been very aggressive savers for the last, like, 30 years or so. And he was worried that he was saving too much because a colleague of him of his told him that he um, was postponing his life and, you know, missing out and stuff. Mm. So, you know, you have people who are doing just fine, people who, you know, maybe they could benefit from saving a little bit more, and people who have been following all of the rules that, you know, advisors typically say to do and are still worried about retirement. Yeah. So it's been really um, – it's been interesting to, to see all that and to, you know, I've, I've loved being able to help people you know, just make sense of their situation. A- absolutely. And just real quick, so is this column, um, how can people access the column? Is it just through the marketwatch.com website? Is there a specific URL that people can go to? Yeah, so it's um, on the Market Watch retirement page. You, you should be able to see it, but there's also a little tab where you could search Help Me Retire, and you'll see the – the article so far. There's only been three because we only started it three weeks ago. I do it mm-hmm. about once a week. Mm-hmm. Um, and then if they have questions of their own, I just want to make sure I have the right email address before I send people places. Um, it's help me retire at marketwatch.com. So. Yeah, I, th- I think it's great. I mean, I think what, what I really found interesting um, in what you said is that everyone has their own goal, right? And their own, you know, what looks like retirement and how much I need to save will be different than someone who is of the same age, uh, same, you know, where where they are in their career, etc. Everyone has very different outlooks and it's important to plan based on what you think you will need and, and, and know you will need. Um, and also the other, the other thing I thought was interesting is when the person's friend said, hey, you know, you're missing out on life. Um, Hey, you know, I mean, to each their own. If you think that you want to front load your retirement savings and save seven figures, I think it's better to start early, in my opinion. I, that's kind of what I did. But um, I, I think to each their own. Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, we always say that, you know, this is specific to the person's question. But even with the information that they give us, you know, just like an, a financial advisor would say, um, you know, if, if you're not including everything of your personal situation, then this information can only go so far. But it does give people a, um, you know, a direction. So, like, I after I did the one on the COVID-related distributions, which, um, you know, a lot of advisors told me, like, you know, he doesn't need to take the money out of his account. Like, mm-hmm. um, her hours were cut um, just a, a few hours a week, which obviously, you know, money does add up when your reduction in hours does add up Mm -hmm. to like a loss in paycheck, but it wasn't as dire. Like he and his wife were still able to pay all the bills that they had to pay. Um, Advisors said, don't, don't do that. Don't take out uh, the distribution because it doesn't really make sense in this particular situation. You should only do that as a last resort of like you you're scrounging to make your regular payments and you can't do it because of something that uh, happened related to COVID. Um, Other people emailed me after that and they had their own, questions related to COVID and you know it was similar in the sense that it was a you know a coronavirus related distribution or or loan but they had their own little like twist to the situation so um you know this is these questions are meant to give you um you know like some sort some sort of direction but Mm -hmm. of course it can't like solve all of the problems so we do our best (laughs) Yeah, I mean, I think you you lay out a game plan and give people things to think about it, and then if they want to tackle something for themselves, they can probably submit a question or uh, maybe seek the help of a an advisor or a financial consultant to help them along the way. And I mean, I'm sure you're going to be dealing. I mean, I think it's great that you're doing this kind of one on one, and you're allowing other people to kind of look into what um, th- these questions are and what some of the uh, resolutions are i think that will help everyone with their planning and you'll get into i'm sure you'll get into things like taxation um you know it's not just going to be about i would assume and then tell me if i'm wrong about 
coronavirus and coronavirus distributions. I mean, conceivably, this could go on in perpetuity, um, and you would deal with all different types of issues, close people close to retirement, not close to retirement, paying off student oh, yeah. loan debt, everything uh, under the sun. Yeah, and it's, it's really fun talking to advisors about these issues because we do go through various things. So that the COVID one, you know, was very specific to the pros and cons of taking distributions or not and, like, the impact that would have on his retirement savings later in life. But then in the one that I did this week about, um, you know, having a seven-figure nest egg and uh, wondering if, you know, they were messing up their lives and, you know, not enjoying their their time and, you know, and all that, um, we talked a little bit about, you know, the different vehicles to use to save for retirement and just how to um, break up that balance between saving enough for retirement but enjoying your you know, your present day life mm-hmm. um in that scenario he said like he never felt like he was missing out in the last 30 years of saving and you know he, he just asked the question because somebody else told him he was <laughs> missing out um and it, it's interesting because sometimes advisors you know saving for retirement is of course very important but some advisors said yeah there is such a thing as saving too much if you know you really are not enjoying your life and you are worrying every day about every penny um but but yeah so uh it's been fun to like see the the taxes and the health uh, aspects of everything i'm really looking forward to all the other questions we get in the future yeah well kudos to you kudos to market watch dow jones for another innovative idea and it's great to see i you know i'm i'm i don't know proud is not the word i'm, I'm happy to know, to know you and glad that you're doing great work ali always a pleasure chatting with you have a Wonderful holiday. Enjoy Independence Day. Enjoy those fireworks, and we'll catch up with you very soon. Yeah, talk to you soon. You too. Bye-bye. Welcome back, and now we're going to talk a little about retirement, what's happening on Capitol Hill. And Joining me on the line, they are known as the Legal Eagles, David Levine, Kevin Walsh, both are principals with Groom Law Group. Gentlemen, great to have you on the program this afternoon. Thank you, Jeff. It's great to be here. And happy 4th of July weekend to everyone. We hope wherever you are, you are both safe, healthy, and I guess more than both, and having a good time. Thanks, David. And Kevin, I want to come to you because there's obviously a lot going on with private equity, with ESG. But what's top of mind for you in the Eagles this week? Top of mind for me in the Eagles this week is what's old is new. Um, and it's not just what's old is old because what's old is actually new. So wait, 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 Kevin, does that mean I'm new because I'm old? Well, I mean, you're ancient, so you're still old. Oh. You, you, you know what? You know what? My, my gray beard looks pretty darn good in the coronavirus beard. I, uh, I wish I had a gray beard at this point to, uh, to protect me from the pandemic as well. But I had to uh, take mine off a while back because I, I got some, some not the best advice. Um, that would be for me. That would be for me for a client call, everyone. So I understand. But Kevin, can you just get to the substance? Who sidetracked you? Okay, so uh, in 1975, uh, the Employee Benefit Security Administration released a regulation that explained when someone is a fiduciary um, under ERISA by virtue of giving investment advice. Now, under that rule, it's, it's commonly called the five-part test. Um, there's there's five prongs that. You know, uh, someone who's giving advice like a broker or an advisor or an insurance agent or a consultant um, would have to trigger all of uh, in order to uh, be a fiduciary. Uh, Now, that test was deemed, you know, inadequate in 2015. Um, The then Labor Department, uh, they issued a new uh, test for fiduciary status. That test was finalized in 2016. If you go through the preamble for the 20, if you go through what they said in 2015 and 2016, uh, they were explaining that you know the problem with the 20, with the five part test is that you have to satisfy all five prongs. Uh, there's a regular basis prong, uh, there's a mutual understanding prong, um, and that for a lot of rollovers, uh, it might not be considered fiduciary advice under that test. Well, so they do this new test to capture rollovers. It comes out in 2016. Uh, the courts kill it. Um, and then, you know, the, the thought was, we're going back to the old five-part test. So, I mean, that's, that's what happens by virtue of the court killing it. Uh, and then earlier this week, the Department of Labor issued a direct final rule where they are reinstating the five-part test. Now, what's old is new. Here's where things get tricky. They simultaneously issued additional proposed guidance 
And in the proposed guidance, they explained how they think the five part test works. Um, importantly, uh, they say if you're providing first time advice, but you think there will be subsequent advice, well, then that first time advice can be can satisfy, you know, the, the frequency of advice prompt. They say, you know, if you're giving rollover advice, rollover advice generally can be covered advice. Um, and they also say that, you know, if you if you tell someone, you know, I'm, I'm not your fiduciary, don't rely on this, um, that that might be ineffective in terms of the mutual understanding prompt. So what's old is new in the sense that the 75 test is back. But what's different is that the Department of Labor seems to be trying to you know, change the way that the rule is understood, uh, even after the rule has been kind of well understood and well fleshed out by courts for the past 45 years. Okay. Well, that's interesting. So we're in a time machine. David, any thoughts on this? You know, well, it kills me. I burned up my time, you know, joking with Kevin at the beginning. But I agree. It is totally back to the future. It's a great movie for Fourth of July weekend, by the way. And, (laughs) and, you know, the trilogy is great. But I, I definitely think there are all these nuggets that Kevin's been walking us through, especially as we're looking forward to a new world and the companion exemption. Mm -hmm. There's a lot in there. And I think maybe Kevin, if it works for you, maybe we'll return to peps in one of our calls soon because in one of our uh, segments soon, because realistically uh, if the DOL's interpretation in the fiduciary rule and in the proposed exemption are what it sort of says, it's going to make, there are some challenges ahead for peps that people are going to have to figure out how they deal with if they want to play multiple roles. That's my big takeaway from all of this and I also think with the world of consolidation, the PEP concerns could have broader play. But we'll figure it out as we go forward, Jeff. I won't take any more time because I thought Kevin did a great job. Yeah, absolutely. Well, gentlemen, thanks so much. And I want to wish you and your families a very happy Independence Day. And we'll talk to you all again next week. Thank you so much. Thanks for having us on. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye. Well, that wraps up this episode of the BRN Sunday Podcast. Don't forget to join us tomorrow morning on BRNAM. My special guest tomorrow will be Spark Executive Director Tim Roush. You're going to learn more about their upcoming virtual conference. So until then, I'm Jeff Snyder. Stay safe, keep on saving, and don't forget, roll with the changes.